thank you very much, Michael, and um, uh, 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 thank you to all for taking the time out to come and uh, um, uh, talk to us and exchange ideas about this report that we have. It's really a privilege to be here and uh, present uh, some of the key findings from this work that we've been doing. When we started out this report, as, as Michael has put it very nicely, um, uh, we had this uh, report that we'd carried out in 2009, which had uh, talked about the region needing about $8 trillion over this 11-year period from 2010 to 2020. It's, it's been a number of years since then, and uh, a number of things have changed. And we felt that it was time to revisit our numbers. And um, uh, in, in terms of the things that have changed, uh, two big ones have been the fact that uh, Asia has continued to uh, show fairly robust economic growth. And uh, all expectations are that this would uh, continue. And the second big thing has been the issue of uh, uh, climate change. I think much more than uh, was the case about 10 years ago, there's this appreciation about uh, the, the, the key interrelationships between climate change and infrastructure, um, uh, presenting both uh, challenges but also opportunities as uh, uh, the world tries to make sure that uh, the, the temperature rises are below the two degree uh, Celsius mark as compared to um, pre-industrial times. So um, the, the report has essentially three objectives. Um, the first one was basically to take a snapshot about um, uh, on infrastructure conditions in the region. Um, the second one was, of course, to update our older numbers. And the third one, which perhaps is one of the most important, is to set in place a way of uh, thinking about some of the key policy challenges that arise um, uh, from the numbers that we get. Um, let's go straight to this issue of uh, how much does uh, Asia, in fact, invest? And just by way of motivating why uh, this investment is necessary, uh, we see a very close relationship, a close association between infrastructure and key development outcomes. So as you can expect, um, countries that have better infrastructure are also the ones with higher GDP per capita. That is, is not too surprising. But the interesting thing, uh, the interesting one is uh, uh, the, the one on your right, the panel on your right, where we see that even when it comes to something like uh, extreme poverty, as measured by uh, the, the, the dollar ninety per day poverty line, you see this uh, very close uh, uh, inverse relationship. Now, these are of course associations, they're correlations, but in the report what we do is we delve into some of the micro evidence that's come about on how better infrastructure affects um, uh, uh, the, the population as entrepreneurs, the population as just people who are trying to get to the hospital, people who are trying to educate their children. Um, so there are just a number of different ways in which infrastructure affects everyone's lives. Um, and and uh, the, the, the good micro-research clearly shows those uh, causal linkages to be strong. Um, just uh, um, uh, one, one picture over here on the state of electricity in the region, and I think this captures very nicely this huge heterogeneity that we have in our region. So um, on, on your uh, left-hand side is just electricity generation capacity, and you see that uh, a, a number of countries in our region have done extremely well. So you've got Singapore, you've got Korea, you've got even some of the Central uh, uh, West Asian republics with, uh, um, uh, with, with, with quite uh, large uh, capacity for generating electricity. But on the other hand, you have a number of countries, um, uh, um, India all the way to Nepal, where electricity generation capacity remains quite low, uh, given the populations. And to make that, making that challenge um, even more uh, difficult is uh, the, the chart on your right, where what we see is that transmission and distribution losses also vary tremendously. So uh, the OECD average is about 6% uh, of electricity generated getting lost uh, uh, in transmission distribution. But you have the case of uh, Nepal or even Cambodia, where 20 to 30% of the electricity being generated is lost. Now, part of this is due to technical reasons, uh, you know, using older equipment, uh, et cetera, so you have these electricity losses. But what's also embedded over here is really a, 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 an issue of governance, where the, um, the, the electricity providers are not being able to actually um, recoup um, uh, the, 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 the costs of generating this electricity. So uh, there's both a quantity dimension, there's also a quality dimension. 
Now, uh, one of the things we wanted to do in this report is not just estimate uh, the needs, we wanted to uh, measure precisely how much countries are investing in infrastructure. And we, we, we realized that this is actually a far more challenging task than, than uh, we thought and what most people realize. And the reason is, is uh, uh, quite straightforward. You've got three major investors. You've got the, 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 the central government and subnational governments. You've got state-owned enterprises, and you've got the corporate private sector. And there is no one agency within the government um, which um, takes the lead in aggregating, all the, collecting all these numbers and aggregating them. So we, we had to go to various different types of data sources. We looked at government budget data. We looked at the World Bank's uh, private participation in infrastructure database, which is actually probably um, one of the best sources for information on what the private sector is doing in the infrastructure space in developing countries. And then we looked at um, just national accounts, uh, information on investment, which uh, the, the technical term is gross fixed capital formation. Now, the bottom line is uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on improving measurement, uh, but nevertheless, when we put together you know, the best uh, 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 sort of information that's out there right now, uh, this is the kind of picture we get. So you've got economies like uh, People's Republic of China, Vietnam, uh, investing uh, quite a bit. Uh, you've got even India, which in recent years have ramped up its infrastructure investments. And then on the other hand, you have a number of economies which are investing less than 3%. Now, if you notice, Singapore is an economy which is investing about 2.3 percent. And while this seems relatively low, what the data very clearly shows is that as economies get richer, they have already built a lot of the infrastructure, so richer economies don't need to invest as much. Now, from that standpoint, what is a, a little troubling is to find an economy like Bangladesh or Pakistan investing considerably uh, less than 3 percent. And, and, and for economies at that stage of development, uh, it really does suggest that um, more resources need to be put in uh, into infrastructure. In terms of uh, the breakdown between public-private, so we took our data from government budget sources, uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, the, 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 the PPI database, and uh, the picture we got was uh, something that our uh, colleagues in the private sector felt was, um, uh, it, it, it definitely conformed to uh, their experiences and their views. So you have the telecommunications, which is pretty much becoming a private sector game. Um, there still remains a role for the public sector when it comes to uh, rural broadband, rural uh, um, uh, telecommunications, but essentially it's, it's, uh, tel uh, uh, it's a private sector uh, game. The power sector is interesting. It's about split half and half, and this uh, the private sector element is really coming in from uh, power generation. So transmission uh, pretty much uh, remains a, a, a public sector uh, a domain for the public sector, and distribution there seem to be growing opportunities for the private sector there. But still, most of it in in, in our region uh, tends to be uh, uh, public sector driven. Transport uh, um, about twenty percent. Uh, um, um, uh, of, of transport from the private sector in here. Uh, not surprisingly, this tends to be made up of um, airports, um, uh, some highways, uh, uh, some container terminals, um, but a bulk of the, the road, especially in urban areas, rural uh, locations remain uh, with the public sector. And water and sanitation. Now this is, in principle, something you'd, one would expect uh, the private sector to be in, but it's, it's something we see very little of, and it's um, we, we talk a bit about this report in terms of user charges. I mean, ultimately, um, the, 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 there are two ways that uh, infrastructure gets paid for, uh, taxes and user charges. And um, user charges and water and sanitation seem to be quite difficult for countries in our region. And in fact, uh, we, we understand, e even in developed countries, for um, uh, charging more economically viable um, uh, tariff rates. Now, coming to the uh, uh, needs of the region, um, just a brief word about our methodology. We decided to have two sets of estimates. The baseline are basically taking what we'd done back in 2009 and applying that methodology, just updating all the numbers. And essentially, um, the, 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 the methodology involves looking at Asia's past experience over the last 30 to 40 years, looking at how, how many kilometers of road um, how, how kilometers of road, kilowatts of hour are related to factors like GDP per capita, 
the, the share of urbanization in an economy, the structure of an economy, you know, is it more manufacturing based, is it more services based? So based on all those uh, pieces of information, we're able to establish this empirical relationship and then we project forward. So that's the, um, the, the methodology from 2009. And what we do is uh, we, we make an adjustment for climate change. And in, for, for climate change, we look at two elements. Uh, one is climate mitigation. So here, this is, this is where infrastructure really presents an opportunity in the sense that um, the energy sector and the transport sector both uh, will have an important role to play in, in ensuring that carbon emissions are, uh, 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 are, are, are controlled much more than has been in the past, and in fact, reduced considerably. So that's the climate mitigation aspect, and uh, we had a, a, an accompanying uh, um, a study uh, that, that uh, looked at how much uh, the climate mitigation needs were, so we, we, we used the numbers from that study. And then we look at this uh, issue of climate proofing. We know that extreme weather events are on the rise. Uh, wind speeds associated with typhoons are, are going up. Uh, there's much more flooding taking place. Um, areas near coastlines are, are going to be affected by sea level rise, etc. And so there's this issue of ensuring that the infrastructure you're building uh, is resilient uh, to these changes. And so we, we add the amounts required for climate proofing. Now, I should mention that this climate proofing is really a subset of the costs that are going to be incurred uh, for climate adaptation. Climate adaptation is much more. It's not just about taking your current infrastructure and making it stronger and more resilient. It's about completely new types of infrastructure uh, to protect from flooding, from, from sea level rise. And it's also about uh, just how you think about infrastructure in terms of uh, sustainability issues. And I think maybe in the conversation, there's, there's going to be a bit more discussion um, uh, in, in, on, on these issues. Um, here are some of the numbers, and I'll just focus on the last uh, uh, row. Um, so, so basically, we, we have this uh, number with the climate uh, um, component factored in of 1.7 trillion um, a, a year for the region as a whole. And um, that might, that, that in, in some senses, that is a staggering number. But insofar as um, uh, the, the number as a share of GDP is concerned, um, it's, it's 5.9. So uh, just basically around 6%. So in that sense, definitely something which is uh, doable. Um, in terms of where we see the different types of infrastructure kicking in over the next 15 years, uh, a, a big chunk is going to be the private sector, and that green element is, um, is, is really uh, the extra costs associated with um, uh, climate mitigation. Um, the power sector in particular has a huge role to play in ensuring um, uh, that Asia will be able to meet its uh, 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 targets uh, under the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, and uh, insofar as the transport sector is concerned, um, you, you might be wondering why isn't that green element there? And the reason is uh, there's a lot of debate amongst experts on this issue. And the, the good news really is, and that's, that's the, 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 the part that uh, we have uh, um, taken into account, is that um, in terms of overall costs, it seems like uh, by doing things differently, it's possible to make those investments that are needed in transport, but just involve switches switches from um, uh, fossil fuel intensive modes of transportation to greener ones. And it can be done at costs that do not exceed the baseline estimates. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be cheap or free, but just in terms of the actual infrastructure investments, this can be done at, uh, at uh, uh, the, the baseline costs. Just going to skip a, a bit over here and get to the final part of our report, which is about um, the financing. How is the region going to meet these infrastructure needs? And what we do in this uh, uh, portion of the report is we, we decided to just focus on 25 of our member economies. So we leave out the newly industrialized economies, and uh, we focus on uh, economies which have very good data on public finances. And that's 25 economies. Uh, it includes uh, China, India, Indonesia, all the big ones. Um, in fact, these 25 economies comprise 96% of our region's population. And uh, the, the reason we stick to uh, these 25, as I mentioned, is because we want good data on public finance. And 
in particular because the public sector remains such a big player in the infrastructure space, we want to look at how financial and, and fiscal reforms can actually get more resources uh, out there. And there's a lot of good analysis on possible fiscal policy reforms, uh, and, and so we incorporate those into our analysis. Now, just in terms of some of the headline numbers, um, so in 2015, the 25 economies invested about $881 billion a year. Now, you might uh, say, okay, if you look at, if you think about ADB's old number back in 2009, where we said uh, the region needed about $750 billion between each year, between 2010 and 2020, you'd say uh, the region is doing great. Um, and the 881 is actually a bit higher. The, that would be correct in the aggregate level, but if you notice, it's really taking place because of China. So if you look at that second row, when you remove the China numbers, you see estimated current investments at only about 195 billion. The needs are 503 billion, leaving us a huge gap of about 308 billion a year, which translates into about 5% of uh, the projected GDP. So that's, that's a big gap. That means um, the rest of the region uh, if it were to just continue business as usual in terms of how much it invests, it's still going to be seeing a very large gap. And um, the, the, the last line just makes it clear the, 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 the key role that China is playing in the big aggregate numbers. The last row also tells you that China does need to uh, expand its in, uh, infrastructure investments, but it's manageable. Um, so if we now look at just these 24 economies, so let's take China out of the picture because it, China seems to be on uh, excellent track for meeting its uh, investment needs. Um, we've got uh, current investments. We've got investment need, current investments on the left, investment needs on the right. And uh, how is this gap going to be bridged? Well, our analysis of the different fiscal policy reforms that countries can do. And, and we consider a five-year horizon here because we want this to be relatively credible and realistic. And we have pretty good uh, information on what is possible for countries to do in terms of fiscal policy. So the types of things that we look at are threefold. We, we look at tax policy. So there's quite a bit of scope in some economies to um, uh, basically cast a wider tax base, improve tax administration, and uh, just rationalize tax rates. So we look at that as one element of possible reforms. The second one is uh, expenditure policies. So in a number of our countries, you have big subsidies which are being given for fuel, uh, fertilizers, uh, food. Now, these are, of course, uh, important subsidies for poor households, but the fact is that a lot of these subsidies are not necessarily targeted towards the poor. In, in a number of cases, these subsidies tend to be captured by uh, uh, middle to upper income groups. And we think that there is scope for um, uh, some expenditure uh, uh, reduction over here, at least insofar as the uh, top 50% of the distribution is concerned. Now, this is not to say that this is easy to do. Uh, these are politically difficult reforms for any uh, um, uh, economy to pull off, but the numbers do suggest that the scope is there. The final thing we look at is, um, is um, borrowing. Uh, a number of economies, and in particular, the Philippines is an economy which has been running uh, very limited uh, um, uh, uh, fiscal deficits for a number of years. And basically what that means is the Philippines can actually ramp up, uh, can, the Philippines government can borrow a lot more. Uh, and and uh, it would still uh, leave the debt-to-GDP ratio of the Philippines economy in a very comfortable uh, position. So currently, um, uh, in, in, in Philippines, we see about 30-35% of um, uh, uh, debt is about 30-35% of GDP. And if you look at what a lot of the studies uh, say, in, in particular work done by the IMF is important in this, countries can take up that debt-to-GDP ratio to about 55-60%. So we make, make that allowance, and it turns out that an economy like the Philippines can actually um, can, can increase public finance considerably. So that's how we get that $121 billion. We take these three policy reforms, we quantify uh, how much uh, uh, money that generates, and we also allow for the fact that extra fiscal space is not going to all be spent on infrastructure. About 50% we allow to go to things like uh, education, uh, health, uh, uh, social protection, the rest 
uh, we, we allocate for infrastructure and we find that you get this extra $121 billion. Uh, now what that means is you've got this huge $187 billion still left on an annual basis. Now, how is that one going to be met? Well, first, governments could still do a bit more. We've talked about three types of policy reforms, but in the report, we talk about things like land value capture. So land value capture is something that uh, China has used extremely effectively to fund urban infrastructure, in particular urban transport. But it's not just China. We see uh, Korea has done it. In fact, um, the developed country experience is, is, is very rich on that. In fact, um, I, I think this is the country where uh, probably where land value capture and associated tools have, have been used in a big way um, for, for decades, if not more than a century. Um, but it's something that's not, uh, it, it doesn't really come up sufficiently on the radar when, when we talk to other countries in our region. So that's definitely something we'd like uh, policymakers in our region to pay more attention to. But having said that, uh, it's still uh, a, a, a big role, we, we see a big role for the private sector. And uh, the, the final sections of our report deal with this issue of, okay, what, what types of uh, reform measures are there? I've already talked about the fiscal policy reforms. I'll just uh, spend a, a, a half a minute on uh, the, the, the private participation in infrastructure. Now, what, what we find the literature saying, and, and again, when we talk to a variety of experts, including in the, 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 the private sector, the money seems to be there. Uh, even within Asia, and it's, 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 it's not just the newly industrialized economies in the PRC, um, savings are considerable. Um, it's, about, it's, it's in the order of about $1.3 trillion. Uh, if you look at foreign direct investment into the region, that's also uh, considerable. You could take a fraction of these amounts, and if you could just get it to flow to infrastructure, the, the infrastructure needs could be met. But the challenge really is, the big question is, why doesn't this money flow? And um, to get that money flowing basically means, uh, again, the public sector having to come in in a big way, but this time on the regulatory and institution building side. And, and, and that's where we talk about things that governments can and should do on encouraging more private participation, especially through uh, 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 private-public partnerships um, and, and, and deepening capital markets. And a final point uh, which uh, we have uh, made is, is the one about uh, the infrastructure ecosystem. So uh, once again, this is back to the government. And, and what we find is that uh, in a number of cases, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of scope to actually improve this whole, um, uh, the, the, the capacities involved in planning and uh, the funding decisions and the implementation of infrastructure projects. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of scope to take any country's medium-term economic strategy and uh, translate it into a set of discrete infrastructure projects, carry out high-quality feasibility studies, and in and of itself, that does two things. Number one, it allows public sector uh, investments to become more effective and efficient, but it also develops a, 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 a pipeline of bankable projects that the private sector could uh, get into. So. Um, this is just uh, some stuff on the, the kinds of studies we're, we're, we're planning to do in the future. Uh, and uh, I think I'm uh, running out of time, so we'll just end with some of our um, key messages. It's, it's a big number, 1.7 trillion, but uh, essentially um, the, the gaps that we've just talked about um, are, are large in, in a number of countries, but these can be met with... Uh, a set of reforms which really allows the private sector to, to play a much more important role. So with that, um, thank you very much.